I always say that research is the engine that drives progress. Our next speaker is Professor Mar Tintori, and Professor Tintori is going to share some of the highlights of research in progressive MS. Professor Tintori is a clinical coordinator of neurology in the neurology neuroimmunology department at the Multiple Sclerosis Center of Catalonia at the Hospital Val d'Ebron in Barcelona, Spain. And she's the current vice president of the executive board of ECTRIMS, which stands for the European Committee for Treatment and Research in Multiple Sclerosis. After her presentation, Professor Tintori will be ready to answer your questions. So please submit your questions in the chat box and take advantage of this opportunity to interact with one of the world's leading MS experts. Now it's my great pleasure to present Professor Mar Tintori. Dear friends, dear colleagues, uh, thank you very much for your invitation. It's my great pleasure to share with you during the following minutes some of the highlights in the research on progressive multiple sclerosis. My name is Martin Torre. I'm a clinical neurologist working in Barcelona in the same cat. These are my disclosures. And this is how my presentation will be organized. We are going to see that natural history is now changing in the treated area, that uh, the phenotypes of MS are evolving. We are going to see also that progression starts uh, from uh, the very beginning, that probably we have to measure progression differently that there is an overlapping between progression and aging, we are going also to see the importance of the concept of brain reserve and some of the treatments on progression. So, as you all know, this is a very long lasting disease and uh, the journey is for more than 40 years for many of our patients. If we look to the classical natural history studies, what they tell us is that uh, approximately 50% of our patients will develop a severe disability after 20 to 25 years. If we look to the London Queen Square CIS cohort, what uh, our colleagues have shown is that in patients with more than 10 lesions at baseline, half of them will develop an EDSS of six after 15 years. However, looking to a more recent cohort, such as the Barcelona cohort, what we saw is that in our patients after 15 years, only 9% needed a cane after these uh, 15 years, telling us that we had lower disability accumulation in our cohort. When we first saw this data, we were really surprised. However, looking at other very also recent cohorts, such as the EPIC in UCSF in San Francisco, they show us that uh, in their uh, cohort, uh, around 5% have developed EDSS of six after 10 years or 16% after 20 years. So very similar to the Barcelona cohort. What uh, we have seen in these last 25 years is that uh, we have been able to reduce by 77% the mean time from CIS to diagnosis. And also we have been able to reduce by 82% the mean time from CIS to treatment onset. And probably these and other fact factors are uh, now, um, we are now seeing that uh, we have a milder cause of this disease. Also, it is important to highlight that uh, the phenotypes are evolving. We were used to talk about primary and secondary progressive MS, but already the 2013 revision told us that 
we may merge these categories into the progressive disease category and highlighting more the importance of uh, being active or not active this uh, progressive disease. Active means the presence of uh, relapses or the presence of new T2 or GAD. And why is it important to focus on active disease? Because activity means inflammation. And we know that inflammation is something that we know how to target. It is important also to understand that inflammation is related to age and disease duration. But uh, uh, we have to now focus on when does progression begin. And uh, we are used to think about this disease on uh, categories. And we are used to think about the preclinical phase, the relapsing remitting phase, and the secondary progressive phase. But uh, in fact, uh, Probably this is only because uh, we like to make categories and also because prescribing guidelines, they tell us to do so. But uh, in fact, uh, it, there is a lot of uh, progression that is already occurring many years before we label it as a progressive phase of the disease. And uh, also, let me share with you some interesting uh, uh, data. This is a very nice study uh, performed by, by our Norwegian colleagues in which they took young men that had to start their military service. And these men were, had uh, a cognitive uh, test uh, performed. They were able to link this data to the Norwegian MS registry to identify those that later were developing MS. And it is uh, striking to see that uh, patients that were performing less well on their cognitive test, they were uh, already identified and they had, were at risk of developing relapsing MS after two years, or even more striking, they were able to identify patients developing primary progressive MS 10 years before they started these symptoms. Also, if we look to a population of relapsing remitting patients, such as the, pro the population that has participated in the OPERA 1 and 2, which is the Ocrelizumab trial, we can see that uh, there is a proportion of patients that have uh, started disability accumulation. And when we try to understand whether this disability accumulation is due to incomplete recovery from relapses or to progression independent of relapses, what we see is that in fact, the great majority of uh, the handicap that is occurring is because of silent progression. So this silent progression is already occurring in the relapsing remitting phase of the disease. The problem probably is that we are still using EDSS to capture what happens uh, in, in, in our patients. And uh, especially when we are dealing with uh, EDSS between zero to three, EDSS is not very sensitive to capture these early symptoms. And there is a lot uh, around fatigue, cognitive difficulties, or decrease in productivity that is not captured by EDSS. Probably if we are able to use uh, digital technologies and patient-related outcomes, we will be much more able to detect uh, what happens during this silent progression that we nowadays are not able to capture. Also, it is important to understand that many of the things that are occurring when we are talking about progression, which is that the inflammation that we see in, in, in is different, it is a compartmentalized inflammation, we see axonal degeneration, microglia activation, 
mitochondrial injury and uh, oxidation, all these features, in fact, are also very similar to the features that we find in aging. So when we are dealing with addressing uh, progression, in fact, we are also dealing on how to face aging. I would like now to take you a few minutes to uh, go into the concept of brain reserve. I would like you to imagine that our brain, our central nervous system, is a pool with water inside. This pool is divided in three anatomical regions with increasing amount of water. And the water means our functional reserve. All what happens uh, below the water is what we see clinically. And all that is under the water is uh, what is uh, uh, below the clinics. This concept of brain reserve comes to from other fields of neurology, for example, of uh, Alzheimer disease, where you have this uh, decline in cognition that uh, is compensated during a certain period of time because of this brain reserve. And it arrives to a threshold it, in, into which this cognitive decline enters into the trouble zone and is clinically manifested. So if a person has more brain reserve, this ends in that the clinical manifestations of the disease is uh, delayed. In multiple sclerosis also, we have this brain reserve. And uh, as I mentioned, we have all that happens below the water that is clinically manifested. But there is a lot that happens also below the water. And because of aging, we are already losing brain reserve. Our tank is decreasing in water. But also every as relapse that is occurring, every little new lesion that is happening also is contributed to this decrease in the water tank. And when this decrease in water is uh, below a, th a certain threshold, there is a lot that was not clinically manifested, but because it was under the water, that becomes then feasible. And this is the secondary progressive phase of the disease. And now let me uh, uh, share with you some of the concepts uh, related to the treatment of progression. I would like to start my mentioning that the best treat, the best treatment for progression is really early treatment because with progression, what we need is to stop and to uh, uh, not reaching this threshold of clinical progression. So early treatment is probably the best treatment for preventing progression. But if we are dealing with uh, drugs that are specially uh, approved and dealing with progression, as you see in the cartoon, there is a, a, an increasing number of drugs approved for this disease. And we have several of them that have been approved specifically for patients with uh, progressive MS, either primary progressive, secondary progressive, or active secondary progressive. I would like to share with you some old studies related to to interferons in secondary progressive or in primary progressive MS. This is a study we performed years ago in our center in which patients that were treated with, pro with interferons were compared to placebo in patients uh, for two years in patients with primary progressive MS. As you see in the cartoon, after two years, there were no clinically differences between those patients treated with interferon and those patients treated with placebo. However, we were able to follow these patients for three more years. And what we saw is that after three more years, 
there was a difference between those that had received interferon compared to those who had received placebo, telling us that probably when we are dealing with an intervention here in the progressive phase, we have to wait more to see the uh, benefits of this intervention, telling us about this therapeutic lag that can occur when we are dealing with progressive MS. There is, uh, uh, you know, siponimod, uh, which is a selective S1P receptor that has been tested against uh, placebo in patients with uh, specifically secondary progressive MS. And there is an open label study, extension study that is, that, that is currently ongoing. This uh, drug has shown a decrease in the six months confirmed disability progression of 26% for the overall population. And if we select those patients with an active secondary progressive MS, the effect is uh, wider of 37%. And uh, if we look specifically to those patients who started the treatment with an EDSS of 6.5, so uh, a very uh, a pretty advanced phase of the disease, you can see also benefits in these advanced stages of the disease. Also, the drug has shown some improvement in terms of uh, processing spins, in terms of cognition and also interesting results in terms of uh, atrophy, total brain or cortical brain atrophy, and some hints of efficacy also looking at uh, uh, MTR, which is a way of looking at the integrity of the, of the myelin. Also, uh, interesting uh, phase two studies uh, with simvastatin, this is a study that was performed some years ago, showing that sanvastatin can decrease the uh, atrophy of uh, our patients. And uh, there is a phase three that is currently ongoing to try to replicate these results. Also, interesting results from a phase two, two study with uh, ibudilast that also shown a decrease in atrophy and of course, a phase three is uh, uh, needed to um, confirm these results. We had the opicinumab, who was a very interesting drug, the antilingo, which uh, was thought to have an effect on the precursors of the uh, um, precursor cells. But uh, unfortunately, uh, this drug has now discontinued this, uh, its development very, very shortly. Also, interesting results from uh, uh, Clemastin, who showed uh, an improvement in VP, but also small studies that have to be replicated. The MS Smart uh, showing uh, the trying to, to, to test the efficacy of different drugs was unfortunately negative and lipoid acid uh, also small study showing an antioxidant uh, effect on, on uh, atrophy again also we need to replicate uh, these uh, results. So we have uh, of course, also the important roles of B cells now, and uh, you are all aware about the results of the oratorio trial, which confirmed the effect of ocrelizumab in patients with primary progressive effect, MS with a, a 24% reduction in the confirmed disability of 12 months, and also confirmed at 24 uh, at uh, 24 weeks, sorry. Again, an, an important effect in the MRI variables in terms of T2 and also important effect in terms of uh, atrophy. Of course, when dealing with uh, these treatments, we have to also consider 
the risk of uh, adverse events, especially the risk of uh, infections. As you know, when we are dealing with progressive MS, we are also dealing with patients that have a more advanced disease, more advanced age. So we are dealing with uh, the effects also of uh, aging and disability. So it's a special concern related to infections and also specifically during this COVID pandemic. So again, we have to waive the benefits and the risk on an individual basis. This uh, is uh, uh, the pipeline. I haven't uh, go through all it, but uh, fortunately, the pipeline is expanding. And this is uh, thanks to the efforts mainly of the Progressive MS Alliance, who is fostering this uh, treatment uh, pipeline. Of course, we need to consider that not only medications are playing a role, but we need to also think about the other approaches. Rehabilitation is uh, key and also the role of exercise and the role of environmental factors, because these environmental factors are modifiable factors. And here I need to uh, uh, highlight the importance of uh, smoking, who really uh, has a deleterious effect, the effect also of uh, overweight, the effect of low levels of vitamin D or of having a not healthy diet, all these environmental factors are also playing an important role and also the very important role when of comorbidities, especially in the, the progressive phases of the disease where we are also dealing with aging. And I would like you to concentrate on this brain reserve concept. We all have a premorbid uh, brain reserve and there are things that can decrease our brain reserve. They decrease the water in our tank. And for example, if uh, we are not addressing uh, uh, inflammation with this disease, we are decreasing the water tank. We also know that comorbidities are decreasing the water tank and also, of course, aging. But aging is something we cannot delay. However, an effective treatment and uh, uh, improving our lifestyle and taking care of comorbidities such as cardiovascular comorbidities, taking a healthy diet or a good sleep, all this speaks for maintaining this reserve. And also, if we maintain this uh, potential reserve, it's also important to maximize the use of our resources. And this is what the rehabilitation does. It maximizes our resources. And also, for example, treating depression also speaks about uh, using our resources more efficiently. So these are my conclusions. MS natural history is changing, fortunately, in the treated area. We have seen that the phenotypes are evolving, but probably progression starts much earlier than what we consider nowadays, including my, uh, it can, um, we have data showing that it, it can even uh, starts uh, years before clinical manifestations. Aging is key when to understand the progression and we need to bring into the discussion the concept of brain reserve and cognitive reserve. And probably clinical progression starts early in the disease course but becomes only visible when reserve fails. The best treatment for progressive MS is early treatment. Fortunately, we have the first drugs approved specifically for progressive MS, siponimod or crelizumab, mainly having an anti-inflammatory drug. 
please consider that the long-term effect of these drugs may be larger because of this therapeutic lack. And uh, also consider that other strategies, including healthy lifestyle and rehabilitation, are crucial to maintain brain reserve and for maximizing the use of our resources. And of course, the uh, neuroprotective agents are still lacking and very much needed. And this is all our group in Barcelona. We hope uh, we will be able to see you very soon in life and that we will be able to, to share experiences more on the personal basis. Thank you very much, uh, all of you, for, for listening to this to this talk. Um, I'm happy to take uh, some questions. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, Professor Tintori. We do have time for a couple of questions. And one of them, one of our attendees is asking if the current treatments for secondary progressive MS are for people with active disease, is there something in the pipeline for people living with secondary progressive MS who don't experience active disease? Well, this is a very good question who uh, has a difficult uh, answer because uh, these uh, drugs that we have uh, approved uh, for active disease have shown a more um, definitive effect in those patients showing activity, but they have also shown some effect in those patients who do not present active uh, disease. So. This is one thing to consider, and therefore, I think that in patients who do not have active disease, there is also a discussion to, to, to take place, uh, looking at the pros and cons of these drugs, but I wouldn't uh, discard uh, these uh, drugs in young patients with short disease duration, even if there are no, uh, for example, uh, changes in the MRI. Another thing is also to look at the spinal cord MRI. Many times we only look at brain MRI and many things are happening also in the spinal cord. So I would uh, also recommend to do a full brain and spinal cord MRI, looking for activity that may not have may not be I uh, would also uh, focus on the uh, concept of, of, of reserve. There's a lot that uh, we can do individually, uh, giving up smoking, doing uh, a healthier lifestyle, doing rehabilitation. All of this uh, is also speaking, reinforcing this concept of, of brain reserve. And of course, there are all these neuroprotective drugs that are in the pipeline that we hope are going to, to bring us uh, better news. But um, I think uh, there is still a lot to be done in terms of brain reserve just now without waiting uh, before we, we wait for these neuroprotective drugs to come. Well, thank you very much, Professor Tintori, for a very interesting presentation covering a lot of ground in a very short period of time.